Come on, you may have a seat. Man, it's so good to see you this morning. Man, it's so good to see you this morning. Thank you, Mr. Jacob. Thank you, my brother. Good to see your bride in the house this morning. Amen. Man, come on. Love what's happening here. Man, blessed to be a part of this church, man. Blessed to see what God is doing here in this house. And, and uh, when we understand praise and worship, it's an honor to be able to come in and, and give God praise and to praise him and to know that it really isn't even about us. We are here to give praise and to bless the Lord and to worship him. Isn't it a bummer that, that some come to church and say, I want to receive praise today. Well, that's opposite of what we're here to do, man. It's amazing that we can walk in such great unity here at the church, congregating as a community and as a family on a Sunday morning to say, God, all together, we're just here to bless you. And man, we're just here to be amazed by you. And we're here to thank you. And we're here to raise up our hearts and our hands and our voices to you that we truly, listen, I don't know of an, another time in church, another time in the week that the church, the community comes together, that we are one church and we have one voice and we produce one sound and there's such a unity in the body when it comes to worship man it's a beautiful picture and I love I love our worship team and what they're doing and the level that they are gaining and where we're headed in worship it's so good church we're so blessed man always always be thankful man of what God is doing here and always come prepared and ready good and bad in loss and in victory I love that in loss and in victory, we're here to prepare our hearts to give thanks to an almighty God who, who is truly amazing and wonderful, who loves us with such great mercy and compassion, and it's just so good to us, man. I love it. So we are so pumped to be here today. As you can see, man, I have some candy bars with me today. I had a great gift this morning. These are Steeler candy bars. I love, keep the Steeler food coming, church. Listen, this is, this is milk chocolate. This is not dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is sinful. It's not really of the Lord. Because dark chocolate is like healthy for you. Like, oh, eat dark chocolate because it's healthy for you. Healthy and chocolate, not in the same sentence. It's like, it's like caffeine and decaf, you know, shouldn't happen. Like it just, decaf is useless. It doesn't make any sense to drink decaf. But when you come to a place to realize that today is the Steelers Day, going to tromp on the Patriots. They wear the red, white, and blue. Think they're all, you know, whoo, look at that, man. This is Steeler Nation. We're catching on. It's awesome. Somebody went to Pittsburgh and said, I went to a Pittsburgh store and I got this for you. And I'm like, Excellent. And my daughter, my own Olivia, love her, bless her, about to get kicked out of the house because she tried to steal one of my candy bars. And she tried to stick it in her pocket. I'm like, what are you doing? And then she probably had the thought, my dad's a generous dad and he loves me. Of course I can have one of his candy bars. Heck no, woman, get your hand off of my candy bar. And, uh, and it was great. It was great. But we're so excited about it that. Come on. Come on. It is so blessed to be here this morning, man. We're excited about the Word of God. I'm just asking that you walk in this this morning because even in our amazing, amazing time of worship this morning, it's so powerful. Come on. I believe this. I believe God is going to speak to you in the next 20, 25 minutes. I believe God is going to speak into your heart this morning. It's just some, some good stuff as we continue in our Christmas story. And this morning is, is the title, More Than a Manger. And just going through this and studying this and preparing. And, and listen, I was raised in an amazing godly home with amazing godly parents. And just my mom's parents and my mom's grandparents and great-grandparents. And I have passed this throughout the history of my whole heritage. And you come to a place where you read the Christmas story over and over and over. How many times have you read the Christmas story? And we love, I love this season. I love Christmas. We love snow. Man, 18 inches at the valley. Squeak, we're skiing soon. We love this. But when you come to a place, it can be just become normal like you know Christmas is and, and listen we're way past Christmas being out presents we, we know that it's not gifts are great being generous is awesome blessing the family woo, all for it and then we come to a place I think sometimes even in the church we come to a place and just and just really make Christmas about the manger and we kind of just stop there you know December 26th comes along and it's no longer about the feeding trough when you when you begin to realize that Christmas is so much more than just the manger. The story that we celebrate, that we read in Matthew and that you read in Luke about, about the amazing supernatural events that surrounded this amazing event that God would leave heaven and come to mankind. And you begin, begin to unfold this and unpack this thing to realize and you have to come to a place to believe that it's so much deeper than just a feeding trough. So much more than just a manger. 
Of all the places, Jesus was born in a feeding trough where there's nasty animals, nasty snouts. Well, I'm sure Mary in her time as, as, a, as a mom with this newborn, she did everything she could to clean the manger and to clean the feeding trough and to get her little nest all perfectly, incredibly nice, knowing that this was the Son of God doing everything, but still laid this baby in a, in a feeding trough where animal snouts were, where their spit and snout would go in. It's just, it really is a nasty, nasty scene. What happens when you can, as the church, man, and as, as a follower of Christ, as one who realizes that this whole coming of Jesus that we've kind of pegged as Christmas, this whole coming of Jesus is so much, so much more than him being born in, in a feeding trough. I mean, I just, I want to get into this Philippians 2 and, and Matthew 2, please, two places, Philippians 2 and Matthew 2, and I want, I want to show you some things when you and I begin to really understand that, you know, when you understand that the Son of Man didn't come, he didn't come to, to be served. I mean, when you understand that he left heaven, and you understand that, that, that God put on flesh and left heaven, he comes to a place to realize that he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And why did he come to serve? So that he would be the ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. When you come to begin to just dive in to the depth of one scripture, the Son of Man didn't come. Jesus says, I'm not here so that you could serve me. I'm here to serve you. And in me serving you, it's so that I would be the ransom for many. Man, when you begin to realize that the manger, yes, it's important. Yes, the feeding trough is incredible. All that story is amazing. But what happens even in this season, that we're the ones who came up with Christmas, but when you read through the scriptures, whole, oh, you come to a place, you've got to dive in and say it's more than just the manger. There's a depth to this story. And it's a miraculous, incredible, incredible story. So, man, I believe this, that God is going to speak this morning. And we can walk out built up. And we can walk out encouraged. And we can walk out blessed. But I ask that you would hear this and that you would really pray with me this morning. God, open my ears to hear this. God, open my heart that I would respond to this this morning in such a real way. I mean, I love this. I've had an amazing week of just study and fasting and praying and believing. And I believe, man, we had a powerful first service. And I want you to get this, man. I want you to hear this this morning, that you walk out different from when we came in this place because we're in the presence of the living true God. And man, he has a desire to feed us and to speak to us from his word this morning. Father, we're just here and we're here on purpose. No one's here because they have to be here. God, we're here because we want to be here, God. Father, we ask that you, by your spirit, you would just speak into our lives. The God of all creation, by your Holy Spirit, you, you can speak to us today. If we would hear from you. God, you can speak. That's amazing to me. The God of all creation wants to speak to little old me. Father, we just have a heart to say, I'm here. I'm, I'm on purpose. I want to hear from you. But you would ask God, God, speak to me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians 2 says this. Look at this with me, please. Verse 5 says this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God. And you got to get this, man. When you understand what took place, he, this is talking about Jesus. Jesus existed in the form of God. When you understand Jesus has been forever. He's always been. Jesus has never had a beginning. He didn't start in the feeding trough, church. He was always been. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Called the Trinity. Crazy, crazy story. Cannot define. Hard to dig into. I've read the theological books. I've done a whole study on the, on the Trinity and trying to wrap your head your mind and around about these these three who are yet one but yet have different functions but yet they are still all God God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and then how they split up and do it's it's whoop, crazy but true and you see here in Philippians 2 you see where he existed in the form of God he's always been God and, and what happened when you really can, can understand the truth that this is more than a major? What happened when Jesus left heaven, yet still God? 
When he left all of his glory, when he left all the angels, when he left that which he knew forever and eternity, he left being face to face with his father. That's what he gave up. He gave all of that up to come in to this world which he created, to, to a man which he created that messed everything up and sin showed up and death showed up and destruction showed up and arrogance showed up and, and jealousy showed up and pride showed up and man just thought they had it. And yet in all of the mess, you've got Jesus who is God who left heaven heaven to come to that which he created in perfect perfection but yet man blew it and yet he comes to fix the man issue which he didn't have to but he did and what is it that he actually gave up when he actually showed up in the feeding trough you see look at philippians 2 gives us an idea it says this that he existed in the form of god he did not regard equality with god a thing to be grasped talking about in a sense of Yet still, please don't miss this. He's always been God. Even when he put on flesh, he didn't lose his deity. He didn't give up being God. He was always God, 100% God. Yet when he put on flesh, he became 100% man. To be the actual sacrificial lamb for man, he had to put on flesh in such a miraculous, incredible, crazy way, surrounded by the supernatural. But yet, please don't misunderstand anything in this, that he was still, has always been, was here on the earth and always will be will be deity, and always was God. And he says this, verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. Emptied himself. Church, what happened when he left the presence of angels? And he left that which was in a place of complete and total peace. Where there, He left heaven in a place that there is no sin. A place, no sorrow. He left that where, where, where he understood there was a sense of his glory that you've got to understand where he was truly worshiped in heaven. And there was the sense of glory that surrounded him that when what what did he give up when he came to earth? You realize he left a place of perfection. He left that sense of glory. He left that sense of worship and put on flesh for what? What what was the trade off? What did he empty himself? When you begin to realize this is more than a feeding trough, that when Jesus showed up, he gave all of that up so that he could come here and be served, that he could come here and be worshiped, that he would come here and people would just follow everything that he said. Of course not. He came here to be rejected. He came here to be spit on. He came here to be beaten. He came here that they would actually kill him. That was the people that he actually came for, actually put him on a cross. He came here to be lied to. He came here to be lied about. And I was thinking about that this week, man. There's one thing that you would come to my face and you would lie to me about a face and we can deal with that. But there's another thing when you know that you're being lied about and you have no idea how far that spreads. And here, this is, this is Jesus. This is God in the flesh. This is Emmanuel, God with us. This is what he did. He left that which was a beautiful, amazing, incredible place of glory to come here on purpose, to be ejected, on purpose, to truly be lied to, on purpose, to be lied about, on purpose, to be betrayed, on purpose, to, to get this, get this, to not even have a place to lay his head when he was in his adult life. <laughs> the birds have nests, man. They have their own little, I don't even have a place to rest my head, he said. What? So, so when you begin to see that this goes so much deeper than, than just a manger, he says, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. And man, it's great. I love to celebrate our Christmas season. I love to celebrate the coming of our King. I love to celebrate this incredible Christmas story. But when you, when you begin to come to this place to begin to realize, man, what is, what is the depth of this story? Man, what, what is it that it can't just stop on December 26th? It can't just stop there, flat in the manger. When you, when you go in the depth of this to know, man, he came and he emptied himself and he gave up that, that position of glory to come to this place on purpose to get physically destroyed, to walk into a place, to have to cry out, to the Father again and again in a place of him going to the mountain or him going to a secluded place and going to this place of prayer where, where, where it wasn't any longer a face-to-face -face encounter. Church, what happens when you begin to really see, get this, now watch this, that Jesus, he, 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 he sacrificed and gave up that face-to-face -face with God to be forsaken by God. 
What happens when you begin to really dive into deep of this thing and to know that God, look at this. What would happen that this story is more than a major and we just look at Jesus himself and all that he gave up to come to save mankind. And when you begin to realize, man, could you imagine that for eternity, man, forever face to face with the Father, face to face with God. And, and they have these, these face to face and all of that face to face in order to be forsaken by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he cries out from the cross. So he went from face to face to be forsaken. And this is, this is his coming, that which was perfect to a place that was just such a mess. That was his coming to, and I get, get this, please, please. When you understand that when he says, when he says this, that he, he gave his life up as a ransom for many. And it is God's desire for all to come to the truth. But do you realize that, that narrow is the road that leads to life and wide is the road and many travel it that lead to death? Do you, really, do you please hear this, man? Church, when you really understand that he has such a love for me and I'm a part of that few, man, he came for a few. When, uh, church, when you begin to understand, it is our desire to win as many people as possible to, to Jesus Christ as we have the time to do. It is our responsibility to reach this region as hard and as fast as we can with as many people becoming followers and disciples of Christ. But in the big picture, do you have to understand that we will always be in the minority? There will always be a few compared to the most that will come to this place to be followers of Christ. And in all of that, it's mind-blowing that Jesus knew all this. He knows every single person who's ever going to come to him, and yet he still came for the few. What? You begin to break this thing down to know that this goes way deeper of Jesus coming than just a manger. It goes way deeper than just him coming and just being such a cute little baby in a feeding trough, which is just a crazy story. And turn, turn with me to Matthew 2, please, to understand even from the Christmas story here, we see some stuff that I think we can, that you and I can really, really get out of this. And I've seen this and just going over this, and, and I want you to see this with me because it's, it's a part where you have, you have the Magi now. They're no longer in the manger. They're no longer in the feeding trough. They're no longer in the backside of the inn or wherever the innkeeper put them. Some say maybe it was a stall or, or backside of the inn where the animals were kept because of the feeding trough. And huge, great story, crazy. You know, they got no place to go. And, and here you understand that this is... Mary and all the things, all the things that Mary saw and heard from the shepherds coming and, 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 and understanding, man, this is what God showed us and a host of angels showing up and the whole craziness of Gabriel showing up, even the announcement that she's the favored one, just supernatural after supernatural after supernatural and just crazy and crazy. And now they're out of the, the feeding trough and they're out of the stable, so to speak. And now they're in a room, which maybe the inn opened up after the census cleared. And, and then all of a sudden, You've got this knock on the door, and you've got the Magi who show up. And, and, and the truth of the scripture is the Magi is not a part of the nativity scene. Like if you, it's so funny because, listen, I got to tell you this story, great story. We, we had a woman who met me in Tops, um, and just a, a wonderful young lady uh, who had lost her husband, I believe, to cancer, and she's not a part of Believer's Chapel, but she said, are you from Believer's Chapel? I just, I just need to talk to you just for a minute, and I'm like, Sure, and, and not having any idea what she was going to say. She's like, my husband passed away, but he was a craftsman, and he built this nativity scene out of wood, and it's, it's, a great, it's a great scene, and I just want to bless the church with it. For some reason, you came to my heart. She doesn't come to BC, and, and what you see out there in that nativity scene was from her husband, and the church had a great chance. I sent some men over, and they prayed over her, and it was just, it was just, it's great. We continue a relationship. But in that, they bought these figurines. And of course, with the figurines come the wise men, because you see wise men. And, and we set it all up. And I'm just looking at it going, I can't have the wise men in the nativity scene, because they just weren't there. So truth is, if you look at our nativity, you will see the three wise men to, to the other side of it. And they're on, they're on their journey to get their church. They're not there yet, but they're on a journey. And I, people were laughing at me like, you seriously, you can't do that. Oh, I'm doing it because it's funny. And my wife, tears, I don't know if there were tears of joy, but they were just, it was funny. And it was just like, you seriously going to remove the wise men and put them off to the side to know that they're on the journey where well, there's a star over it and they are, they're headed there. Get the picture. Anyways, um, 
And it wasn't three. We three men of, you know, Ori, whatever. And it's, the, the truth is they had gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How crazy is it to travel that far without any type of security team? And we have no clue how many wise men they were. There could have been bunches. It's even said up to hundreds and hundreds of people in this whole caravan coming to see the, the one who was born king. So it wasn't just three. And, but, but, I, but I want you to see this, that they showed up. And Herod, who was a king, who was an evil, evil king. And he was this jealous, jealous, jealous man who was angry. And, and it, there was this rage that came from him because he, he understood. The Magi showed up in this huge caravan and said, where's the king who's been born? And here you've got this king who's already jealous, who already has a horrible reputation of an angry, angry, rage-filled man. And, and he understood, you got to see this, because he understood that, that he grabbed the scribes and the chief priests and said, hey, listen, dig in, dig into the prophecies, and you, and you tell me where this king is going to be born. And you tell me how this king is going to be born. So here they brought out Isaiah and they brought out, brought out Micah and they brought out these Old Testament accounts. They brought those scrolls and said, well, the Old Testament, well, we call it the Old Testament. The, the prophecies of old say that Isaiah said this from God and Micah said this from God. And then you got to understand, King Herod actually was told that this was the Messiah, that this was the next king who is Jesus, who is king of all eternity. Not so much king of, of a place, but king of the kingdom, you see. And, and the king couldn't handle this. And these are the wise men coming and telling him this, the magi. And then they go off and follow the star. And he's like, listen, we want to worship him. He, he's a liar. We want to worship him as well. So on your way back through, tell me where he's at. And all he wanted to do was kill him. So, but you got to get this because here, what happens when there's this Serious commotion, whether they were still in Bethlehem, which it's believed that they possibly were. And we're looking at maybe six months up to two years where, where Jesus was now a child, no longer just a, an infant, infant, maybe six months, maybe up to two years is what, is what the scholars believe. And, and all of a sudden there's this huge commotion in town and all of these, again, up to hundreds of individuals in this caravan that come to just see this one amazing little child named Jesus. And maybe Mary gets this knock on the door. And because they didn't have cell phones, I and mean, we can just so think way back when they didn't have email, there wasn't anything that said, hey, listen, we're coming. Like, we're on our way, Mary. We'll be there in two years. Oh, great. Like, they, there, that wasn't there. Could you imagine a knock on the door and Mary and Joseph come to the door and and kind of maybe some dust has settled right from, from the whole shepherd thing and the angel thing and the